to the business. Finger in front of lens, yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Misha's hogging the room mic, so. Um, first of all, no photographs, please. Okay? Um, more importantly, I am very happy to, um, to introduce Misha Collins. Um, my friends and I were just discussing what we actually know about Misha. Uh, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is what we know. <laughs> he is a, um, he's been on a lot of TV, right? <laughs> uh, he, uh, he's, he's been very successful. You probably know him because of his, uh, his role on the show Supernatural, right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, he's been on 24, he's been on a variety of other programs. Um, he has, perhaps you are among his millions of Twitter followers, or perhaps you follow him on Facebook. He has this um, enormous and very loyal uh, Twitter following. that I know is because um, I, I actually am I haven't fully followed the arc of his career but I do know um, uh, that my friend Misha is a, um, a very talented man who has a uh, who has um, an audacious belief that he can change the world and you know, most people I think would be very happy with the level of success that Misha is enjoying. The sense I get from him is that this is an instrument which he uses in order to make the world a better place. Um, and not only does he um, use his own time and talents to try and make the world a better place, but he is a remarkable catalyst to get the most out of others. You're probably familiar with his nonprofit work with Random Acts and Geesh Whiz. Um, but the thing that I have noticed about the way he does it is it's not just about him doing something, it's about being a catalyst for others. And um, the, having the opportunity to have someone like Misha come and talk with us about how to develop the kind of presence that he's developed in order to motivate people and uh, create action, I think is a remarkable opportunity for all of us. So I was so very excited when he agreed to come and talk with us. So without further ado, Misha Collins. Thank you very much. Um, is this working? Super intimidating. <laughs> I like your wardrobe. Thank you for wearing it. Um, well, um, I'm excited today for a couple of reasons. One, this is my first lecture of any sort at an academic institution uh, in which I was not sleeping. Um, <laughs> so that's exciting for me. Um, also, I'm uh, because I have a uh, I have a robust. Uh, following on social media, um, I get some advanced editions of new technologies, um, and I get to help beta test some stuff for Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. Um, and, and today we're, um, I'm, yes. I'm actually, it's <laughs> <laughs> a professor. <laughs> um, so today, I'm, I'm uh, proud to be announcing that I'm premiering a new technology on Twitter, which is called uh, 
CHIRP, uh, which stands for, I'm going to read this because I, I sometimes mess it up, it's Conglomerated Hybrid Integrated Robotics Platform uh, that we'll be rolling out uh, over the next 10 to 15 years on Twitter. Um, and basically, <laughs> this stuff right here is all a part of it. And so is this, um, cutting edge technology, which I have right here. It's a, um, you probably have never seen this before. It's called a slide projector. <laughs> I just got to put it on the carousel. They're working out some of the kinks. Um, there we go. Perfect. Wait, is that, is that right? Is that, yeah. Yep, we got it. <laughs> so it's cutting edge technology, so it's a little bit new. <laughs> To, um, am I standing in the right place? Should I be standing back here? Um, I'm going to preface this by saying I, uh, I didn't do a whole lot of uh, research. I didn't look into a lot of peer-reviewed literature for this. Um, nothing that I'm presenting to you is based on data or facts, which in this day and age I think is par for the course. Um, <laughs> but what I am going to just share with you, and, and you know, this is geared toward marketing and how to sort of get your voice out there and amplified uh, in social media. So that's going to be my focus, and I'm going to use as a sort of test case my own platforms. Uh, and so I'm not going to be casting a wide net and giving examples of things that other people do online because I, generally speaking, try not to pay attention to people other than myself. <laughs> so. The data points that I'm exposed to are just the things that I put out there, and so that's what I'm going to share with you. So what, uh, yeah, what I'm presenting is really basically um, hunches and speculation based on um, no, no facts whatsoever. <laughs> so I, I hope that is good for you professors in the front row. Oh, great. <laughs> They're having a slide. They do the same thing. Um, <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> so when I first got um, on a TV show and people started recognizing me, um, my wife, okay. uh, my wife was in graduate school at that point. She was uh, getting her doctorate in history, and she had just read this book on Marilyn Monroe and how Marilyn Monroe cultivated her public image. It was a completely, cult the, the Marilyn Monroe that we, the public, know is a completely cultivated image. And so I started to think, all right, I'm gonna cultivate my own public persona. I'm gonna cultivate my image, because now this is my chance to do that. And I did a few interviews, you know, with reputable outlets like Mashable. <laughs> and, and I tried to parse my words carefully, and I tried to present what I thought was a version of a cool Misha. And it, fucking sucked. It was really <laughs> bombed. And it was because I wasn't being myself. I just wasn't being me. Um, so I realized, okay, that's not going to work. So the version of myself that I have ultimately decided to present online and, and in public uh, is kind of a heightened, playful version of the real me. And that is way, way more effective than something, something that's care carefully cultivated. I had a conversation recently with my friend who lives in town who hosts the NPR show Live Wire, Luke Burbank, and he said, um, when people come onto his show and they're just honest, they're just themselves, it doesn't matter what they're saying, the show is always 10 times better than having a more high profile person on the show who is guarded and, and carefully uh, choosing their words. So be yourself to an extent. Um, I have bullet points, don't I? Yep. No previous. So wrong slide for that <laughs> statement. I'm already on the wrong slide. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the beginning. Um, 
I, I joined Twitter in 2009 because uh, the, the network that I was on, uh, the CW, said, would you answer some questions on our Twitter feed? And I thought, if I answer questions on their Twitter feed, then I'm going to have to, uh, you know, not swear. So I said, I'll just set up my own. And I started messing around, and I had fun. And I had no idea what Twitter was. Um, but I was playful with the, with the platform uh, from the beginning, and that's sort of how I started. And I didn't, I really had no, I didn't know what Twitter was. I literally asked, what is Twitter, on the phone call when they asked me to do a, uh, a Q and A on Twitter. All right, next. This is where I talk about being genuine. Um, oh, I can do this, that second bullet point. Um, so another thing that people make, I think, I see a lot of people making this mistake um, on social media is, and, and this is again from a marketing perspective, but I see people making the mistake of uh, using their social media platforms as a way to get things from people. And if that is your primary motive when you're logging on to your Twitter account, you are going to fail. Because you, in order to be somebody that people want to hear from, you have to be generating content that appeals to them organically. And generally speaking, and there are exceptions to this, most people don't like it when people just ask them for things all the time. Um, so you have, to, you have to be creating something that is entertaining and that is unexpected and that is dynamic if you want people to really listen to you when you ultimately do end up asking them for something. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry about that slide. <laughs> Marketing is boring, it says. I don't know how that got in there. Um, <laughs> but it's actually true. So, sorry. This, uh, the chirp, chirp technology is picking <laughs> in. Yep. Okay, it looks like I need to I need to send out a message shortly using chirp. <laughs> Great. It's so cool to be on the cutting edge of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, every day people are hearing, you know, buy this product uh, and they're hearing people selling things to them and they don't want <coughs> to hear it. So if you're going to be doing that, mask it. Um, don't don't carpet bomb, bomb with, uh, you know, buy now or, uh, oh great. Are you with Chirp? Yeah. <laughs> That's Chirp right here. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank you. I don't know if I'm supposed to tip or what. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Just going to wait a minute on that. <laughs> Hold on. All right, I'm going to talk. I'm, I think this is going to take a second. Um, so the next point is um, yes, sorry. is um, only pitch with passion and I, I think that that's really really true like you you can't effectively sell anything hold on hi, hi. <laughs> um, mom yeah. <laughs> see if you could check to see if that uh, I, I just did a chirp post and I want to see if it came through sweet okay all right well text me when you see it okay great thank you um, they have a confirmation feature, which is really cool. <laughs> um, I, so an example of this um, for me is 
uh, a scavenger hunt that I run. It's called GISHWIS. It stands for the greatest international scavenger hunt the world has ever seen. And I push that. Anybody has done it here? Oh, well, a lot of people. That's amazing. Um, so I push that. When I market that online, um, I do it with a fervor. Um, but it doesn't feel like I'm prostituting myself on my feed because, <laughs> because I really love it and I really believe in it. I really, I really think that it makes the world a better place and that the people that participate in it get something really great out of it. So I don't, I don't have any misgivings about pushing that message out there. And there's no way to fake it. When, when I'm pushing that message, um, people can tell that I believe it. And so they buy into it more. So, if possible, uh, if you end up working for a company, have it be a company that you like and that you care about what they're doing and, and the message that they're sending out. Because otherwise, you're kind of going to be screwed because what you're going to be doing is going to, it's going to feel hollow uh, and people aren't going to listen and you, you're just going to waste your life. Um, <laughs> use clickbait, it's a great trick. So you just say, um, and everybody says, oh, that's clickbait. Clickbait's great. What are you talking about? Um, I'm like, for example, if I'm posting a cooking show of my kids, I'll just post, like, not safe for work. <laughs> and everyone clicks on it because everyone falls for that shit. So, so clickbait is a great tool. Use it all the time. Um, and, and if you're trying to get something out of people or if you're trying to really send a message that you want to make sure people receive, I try to keep that like as a rule of thumb to something like 10% of what I post so that people feel like they're getting a lot in return for the ask that you're, that you're asking them for. Um, okay, so have fun. Um, develop a community in a common language. Um, so what I did is at one point I was on um, Twitter and I, and by the way, I'm using Twitter as an example because I've sort of lived on Twitter more than the other platforms uh, over the years. It, you know, other platforms are emerging as more important right now um, in many respects, but Twitter is still something that I use a lot. So um, I got on Twitter and I posted, uh, I don't really like this term followers. It feels demeaning. I think I'll call you guys minions. And it was, uh, <laughs> A sort of flippant comment, and then they, some people responded, what should we call you? And I said, I don't know, maybe something uh, like Overlord. And <laughs> so that stuck. That was, you know, I think that was back, I can't read the dates right now, but I think that, that was 2009, and that stuck. So there's a lot of people that still call themselves minions, and we're still referred to me as Overlord, which set up a really great dynamic. So um, <laughs> if you can, if you're, if you're developing a relationship with your audience, create, um, create themes in your community and make it feel like a club and make it feel special and set yourself up with a lot of power so that um, you can get away with murder. Um, <laughs> because of this dynamic, I can kind of get away with like not responding to people, ignoring people, kind of being a jerk. It's great. So it gives you a lot of carte blanche. You can't use Overlord because it's mine, but you could use something like that. Um, but, but notice, actually, I didn't really isolate the variables here, so it's hard to say. It's either like posting something that's visually interesting that gets a lot of you know likes <coughs> and retweets. There's a lot of 23,000, 5,000. Um, it could also be that I'm talking about doing acid, so I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, this is a good example of uh, subverting expectation. I also like the idea of uh, understanding what, what best practices are online. You should know them. And then you should occasionally subvert them um, because if you really push in the other direction, that in and of itself becomes interesting. People say, don't post online a wall of text. Well, then maybe you should occasionally post a wall of text because people really liked this post. It's about making lemonade. Um, <laughs> somebody asked online for a quote for their yearbook, and I gave them this. <laughs> we, had a little, we had a little back and forth exchange where they basically promised, vowed, whatever I sent for the quote, they would put in. So I sent this, which would take up two pages in the yearbook. <laughs> this is being visual. This is me and my wife renewing our vows in the produce section of Albertson's grocery store. Um, this is actually an interesting uh, uh, post um, regarding that like image, you know, uh, the, your public image um, and being honest and authentic. When, uh, when I first, you know, people started getting a lot of followers, my friend was like, uh, hey man, sorry, uh, I had that picture of you in a wedding dress in Albertsons on my Facebook and it looks like some of your fans found it. And I was like, oh, come on. 
you know, how can I uphold like these heteronormative values that I'm working so hard to preserve? And then I had this really amazing cathartic moment where I was like, fuck it, that's great. I'm glad that that's out there. And it is, it is good that it's out there in, in the end. So sometimes allowing, embracing your weirdness uh, can be an asset. Uh, I guess I really like the wall of text. <laughs> So this is uh, just a cautionary tale. Don't let your children around monsters. <laughs> that is a giant, giant gummy bear that is made out of pure toxins and sugar, and my son lost his mind after that. <laughs> uh, this is, I just wanted to post this as an example. So um, I don't know if you can see the retweet numbers. There's like 12,000 roughly uh, hearts on that one, and. I don't know what a heart is, but 4,000 hearts on the other one. And they're both, both almost exactly the same message. But one is accompanied with an image, and one is uh, just that wall of text that I love so much. <laughs> I, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm believing that. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, I should have looked at these before so I knew what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna read these out loud because I think it illustrates the point. So what I'm saying is flip, flip conventions, uh, don't do the expected. So don't do this, what I did here, which is the expected. Uh, I just clicked on this link to help get out the vote. Uh, super easy, anyone else wanna join me? Click the link. <laughs> Obviously I was tired and I was out of ideas and I just, <laughs> I have to post something. Um, and then this is, basically the same message, uh, or maybe a slightly different version, but a man elected president of the USA turned out to be possessed by Satan, <laughs> and tonight the same storyline is playing out on Supernatural. <laughs> uh, but you see, it's, you know, it's four times as much engagement when, when you don't do the expected. Um, I'm completely lost. I have paperwork. Hold on. Unexpected. Hold on, hold on. Sorry, guys. Sorry. I'm new to this. Okay. Another example um, of doing the unexpected. This was I was talking about the um, new internet privacy uh, debacle that happened in, in Congress, and what I did is I just posted. Um, you know, they're selling our search histories. I don't know what I said. I could read it. Um, well, I can't read it. Anyway, I said they're selling our. They're going to be selling our search histories. I don't care. I have nothing to be ashamed of in my search history. And then I put together a search history <laughs> that pretty much anyone would be ashamed of. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm really getting this point. I I don't love uh, parlance like the parlance of of social media. Um, you know. In my humble, IMHO and, and LOL and those things, I actually think that they, uh, if, this is now getting into the, in, into the realm of opinion, but I think that they make you look a little bit lazy and it also makes it look like you're just swimming with the stream, like you're, you're just doing what everyone else is doing. So, you know, I mean, it's convenient um, and it's vernacular, but it's not, I don't think it's a great uh, tool when you're trying to communicate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is why we don't normally let professors in these things. <laughs> um, okay, I really hit that point hard. <laughs> that was actually funny. So we met some people in Bellingham, uh, and, and uh, the guy, it was his birthday in the middle, uh, he hates it when people wear pajamas in public. <laughs> so we went to the co-op and we got a bunch of strangers in the co-op to put on pajamas. Uh, pajama bottoms with his name on the, on the bottom. <laughs> and it took him a while to notice. He's like, there's a lot of people with pajamas on. <laughs> they have my face on. 
Um, I don't know what this is. Um, so I guess this is, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate the point that I don't normally use um, hashtags either. Um, I think that they're, by and large, a useless tool unless there's a very specific pur purpose for it, like you're trying to track a specific thing um, or you're trying to get people to communicate on a specific topic. Um, hashtags generally, I think, fall into that kind of lazy uh, Twitter speak or social media speak. Um, and most people aren't ser searching by hashtags um, and they're usually not that effective. So minimize them, use them judiciously, um, is my opinion. Um, I'm not sure what this is about. Um, okay, so this is maybe I can get into some little bit more long-winded technical stuff. What I'm going to talk about here is what's happening right now. It's going to be obsolete information six months from now, but it just gives you a little bit of a flavor of the things that you can stay abreast of in terms of the technical aspects of social media. So. Um, Facebook, uh, by the way, is kind of, if you're looking at things from a marketing standpoint, Facebook is the best way to get any kind of real engagement. So if you want people to click on things, or if you want people to actually buy something, or if you really, really need to get a message out there, Facebook, which we're doing right now, we're on <laughs> Facebook Live. So by the way, we're live on Facebook, so don't say anything embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Facebook is um, an incredible tool because A, uh, there are more people on that platform than any other platform, and B, you, they have so many tools that you can use to reach your audience in a specific way. Um, their algorithms, um, basically, I don't know if you all know this or not, but if, you, if, if you're a business or a person um, on TV um, and you make a post, Typically, that post will only reach somewhere between 1% and 5% of your audience. It will not even make it onto their feed um, because Facebook knows that nobody wants to hear the garbage that you're saying, and so they pull it out. And the way it works is Facebook will send out your message to a very small, select group of your audience. So um, if I make a post on Facebook, I have almost 3 million followers or something. What do you call them? Likes? Likes on Facebook. <laughs> You can tell I'm tech savvy. And, um, <laughs> and if I make a post on, on uh, Facebook, it will go out to a few tens of thousands of people right away around the world. Um, and it's sort of like a test that Facebook sends out in their algorithm. They test it and they see in the first 15 minutes if there's a lot of engagement. Do people uh, comment on it or do they forward it to their friends um, or do they click on the video and actually watch it? They, they, Facebook monitors that. And then if there is a lot of engagement in that first window, then they'll push it out to a slightly broader audience. It'll maybe reach you know, 100,000 people. And if those people engage, it'll get pushed out again. So um, they're very judicious about sending out stuff that they think people are gonna like so that your feed when you're on Facebook isn't clogged with stuff that you're not interested in. Um, so there are different ways that you can you know, uh, tip the scales in your favor. One of the ways you can tip the scales in your favor right now, at this particular moment, on Facebook, for instance, is to live stream. So if you live stream something on Facebook right now, Facebook is trying to, you know, get this technology more widely used, and so their algorithm uh, gives a little bit of preferential treatment to a live stream. So that will reach more people than if I were to pre-record a video and then post it as just a, a video uh, after the fact. Um, there are myriad things like that. There are also incredible tools on Facebook, like if I, for instance, I'm, I'm po very politically engaged these days, and one of the things that I like to do is talk about local races. But I don't want to put, I don't want to tweet to, you know, a hundred plus countries, uh, or make a post that is global about uh, an election that's happening in Georgia's sixth congressional district, because 99.9% .9 of the people that are getting that message aren't going to be interested. But now on Facebook, for instance, you can make a post that is targeted just to Georgia's sixth congressional district. Only people who have put their address in when they you know, set up their Facebook credentials who live in that district are going to get the message. And it won't go to anyone else. And there's two reasons that that's beneficial. One is that there's going to be higher engagement. So if somebody is from Georgia's sixth congressional district and I'm sending them a message, they're going to be like, 
hey guys, do you see? The guy from Supernatural is talking directly to us, and they're going to forward it to all their friends. And so you can really penetrate that local market very, very effectively. If I were to post that broad, widely without any uh, geo-targeting on it, it would not go anywhere because there would be relatively zero engagement on it because nobody outside of the sixth cares. Um, so there are all kinds of functions. You can, you can, you can uh, filter by demographics, you know, age, sex, uh, uh, sexual identity, whatever you want. You can, you can uh, you know, they really, Facebook knows whether you're going to break up with your boyfriend before you do. Um, <laughs> really, it's actually true. Like they, their algorithm is like, you know what, it looks like they're not doing so great here. <laughs> you know, she's liking a lot of other dudes' uh, Facebook posts right now. <laughs> so be aware of that. <laughs> Um, here, uh, here's other technology. Like right now, um, at this very moment, Gishwiz, uh, on the Gishwiz Facebook page, is hosting a live stream of a poll. And people are watching the poll live and clicking on the poll to choose our mascot for this year's scavenger hunt. And it just draws people in because there's something they can click. And people are basically monkeys. So, <laughs> so that's you know that's happening right now. There's a live stream there, and people are clicking, and that's a technology that just became available to be able to do that. Um, so just paying attention, I think, to you know what's happening on these platforms. Um, that's my grandfather. <laughs> yep, I already did that. Don't yell at me. <laughs> um, so this is a kind of a conventional best pra practice that I think a lot of people will tell you. Um, if you're on social media and you have a company or if you have a public personality and you're trying to push it, uh, if you really want people to engage with you and listen to you, you need to be posting morning, noon, and night. You need to take a photo of your, of your coffee at Starbucks and then your breakfast and then your lunch and you've got to be posted constantly, and you've got to be responding to everybody that replies to you, and you have to, have to keep your feed really uh, alive. I think that's horseshit, because what ends up happening is, yeah, yeah, people will see your stuff, uh, but they'll stop listening. They'll skim over what you've posted, and they'll move on to the next thing, and your reach will diminish. Uh, you might end up with a lot of likes on your thing, but your reach will be really small, because people aren't going to engage with what you've done. So I try to be pretty sparing about how much I post. Um, according to best practices, I post way, way too infrequently. Um, but I actually think that posting quality stuff is much more effective than, than um, a large quantity of stuff. Um, likewise, I don't feel like you have to reply to everyone who makes a comment on your thing. And I don't think that you should feel like you have to either. Um, it's OK to not reply. Um, it's sometimes tempting to engage with every, everybody that wants to talk to you. But this is not like, it's not your email. Um, and you don't have to respond. Email, you do have to respond to. If I send you an email, please respond. <laughs> um, negativity bias is a really interesting thing online. So if you, uh, when I first got on Supernatural, um, I was like, oh, I did, I, they, they signed me on for three episodes, and I was like, oh, they're going to kill me after three episodes. And then they didn't kill me after three episodes, and I was like, oh, maybe they don't hate me. <laughs> but do the fans hate me? And so I would look on these you know, chat threads after the episodes aired, and I'd be like, oh, what are they saying about me? And there would be like 150 posts, like, oh, he's so dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> what a hunk. <laughs> Love his deep voice. <laughs> and then, uh, wow, you know, one, one person would be like, oh, that was a pretty flat, monotonous performance. Which, although true, um, <laughs> that one negative comment would be the only thing I took away. And all of the positive stuff I would ignore because of a very common phenomenon, which is negativity bias. We're actually scanning for, you know, people saying bad things about us. And we will latch onto those like they're really important. And those are the things that people tend to engage with on social media. So if somebody says something bad about you, you, uh, you're like, well, I have to say something back to that person. 
Not if somebody says something good to you, you're like, well, thank you, thank you. But I'm too, mod <laughs> I'm too modest to engage with that. But if someone says something bad, you engage. And then that's sort of fueling the fire. So allow yourself to, um, to sort of take the temperature of the group. And if you're seeing a lot of negative comments, if you're seeing a lot of, well, that was a flat, monotonous performance, maybe spice it up a little bit. But if it's just one or two, um, then you really, you have to be disciplined about letting yourself ignore that because otherwise you'll go crazy. Um, I don't know what don't put, set the bar too high is. <laughs> but it sounds like good advice. Um, <laughs> all right. Hmm. Um, Um, yep, yep. I'm catching up to myself. Okay. So, um, social media is, it is truly social. And it, it is, um, it serves as a proxy for real social engagement. Um, very effectively and actually really helps a lot of people. Um, there are a lot of people who wouldn't feel like they are socially fulfilled were it not for the friendships and relationships that they have on social media. But that said, um, don't, I, I'm, I'm saying something we all know, but don't, don't live in social media. Try to have a peppering of real interactions with people um, face to face because nothing supplants that and also you can't actually be yourself on social media. You are a representation of yourself on social media. So don't allow yourself to get lost in social media, and also don't allow yourself to hide in social media. Um, it can be a real crutch, and I see a lot of people doing that. Um, there's nothing worse than you know seeing people at a dinner table where all four, two couples go out, and all four of them are buried in their phones. It's like, what is happening? Why are you here? Um, I mean, it's good for the purveyor of the restaurant, but not good for them. Um, don't take it. Um, don't take it too seriously. The more playful you are, um, the more irreverent you are, the better results you're going to have because people um, are galvanized by that. Um, people are inspired by people who <coughs> break the rules or break conventions. So um, look for ways to do that. Um, and don't sell your soul, I sort of said before. Um, don't, don't, be, don't be working to sell something that you don't believe in. If you find yourself in that situation, look for a different situation because that's not, um, that's not a really uh, good way to sustain yourself. Um, okay? That's just forced perspective, uh, a useful tool if you can. This is, a, this is a parting message that I have for you. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can read it, it's sort of a little bit of an IQ test. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize here. Um, <clears throat> when you're online, um, yes, it is a representation of yourself, but try to make it as authentic and genuine a representation of yourself as possible, your results will be much greater, people will listen to you more, and you will feel personally more satisfied in the process. Um, don't oversell things. I use the 90-10% rule, like 90% is not at all selling or messaging, if I can, if I can stick to that, that's the rule. And 10% is trying to get people on board with something that you, that you wanna do. Um, be playful, and be visual, and be irreverent. Um, be informed about all of the tools that are available at your disposal and use them, subvert the use of them, uh, the, the conventional use of them, if you can. Um, uh, quality over quantity. Um, don't give in to negativity bias. It can be very harmful. Um, and, uh, and then uh, this is sort of my parting thing, and then I'm gonna do a little bit of Q&A stuff if people have time to stick around. I know that we're running late. Um, but. Social media can be used as a tool to market things, uh, to, um, to build your brand, to build your own image. 
Um, but it's also an incredible tool for social change and social mobilization. Um, the Arab Spring happened really, really because of social media. All those protests were organized on social media. Um, there, it's it, it can be you know put into the wrong hands, um, like Putin and his cronies, and they can you know they can uh, undermine a democratic mm -hmm. process. Um, but it can be used to great advantage if you um, if you focus on messages that make the world a better place. Um, so remember that that should be your primary objective. Like we're on this planet to make the world a better place, and you have this tool at your disposal um, that is potentially incredibly powerful. It's kind of insane, but I am I'm like this idiot actor on the CW, and I can make I can post something on Twitter about politics. And it'll get more engagement than a post from the New York Times. It doesn't make any sense, but I feel like it is absolutely my responsibility to use that megaphone for good. And, um, and reasonable people can have arguments about this, but I really believe that if you, if you gain enough of a foothold that you have people listening to you, and whether it's 10 people or 100 people or, or 3 million people, um, if you use that platform um, to spread messages that are going to make the world a better place, then you're doing a good job. Um, so that's my parting, my parting message. Um, sort of like the moral of the story kind of thing. <laughs> um, if you guys, I don't know uh, how everybody is on time. You're probably missing classes and stuff. Um, I don't care. But who cares? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Tell them you're sick or whatever. Um, <laughs> Would anyone like to ask any questions or comments, criticisms? Do you have stuff that you want to say to me? Yeah. Thank you, by the way, for bringing me here. Oh. of time, we have a few questions that are that, that we have prepared, oh, that okay. people have Great. sent in. Curated questions. Uh, Sanitized uh, questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first question um, is from Jackie Kaplan, our back, and it's, how do you look so good all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Only because you dress like him. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Sweet. Sweet. Actually, in a roundabout way, Jackie is why I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm more or less cold called, cold called the uh, geology department here uh, because I was like, I want to find out about the rocks around here. <laughs> and Jackie had no idea who this Yahoo was that showed up in her office and she was working and she was like, okay, I will give you this jerk a few minutes of my time. How can I help you? How can I help you, sir? And she toured me around the ge geology department and then she was like, thank you very much. And oh, where do you live? It turns out we live basically across the street from each other. She's like, oh great, come over. We have bonfires all the time. And then uh, now I'm here because Ed lives on the same block, and we all uh, we have a we have a gang. We have a gang now. <laughs> Night fights and stuff like that. It's pretty good. Um, great gang. But yeah, that's that's actually that's why I'm, I'm I'm here right now. So thank you for that tour. It was actually a great tour. Yeah. Um, oh, I didn't answer the question though. I look so good um, because I am uh, borrowing Ed's blazer. Uh, <laughs> Although I was expecting patches on the I mean on the elbow, I'm a little disappointed. But I'm going to make next time. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I actually have some students. Okay, good. <laughs> um, the first question is from Brianna Todd. Um, I like this question very much. Um, it's a two-part question, but I'm just going to read it as one. How do you perform social listening? Do you try and understand what your audience is talking? About? No. <laughs> um, if there's something I, I do very sort of broad, I'm a, but I am an unusual situation because there really is there's so many posts on my feed and in my my fandom that it's kind of hard for me to take the temperature um, at a glance. Um, so I do have I have some people who will email me like you just so you know everybody's talking about this. Um, and, uh, and if I see a theme at a quick glance, am I supposed to be talking to this? He's supposed, oh, to, be supposed to be on there. 
Or you can use my lapel mic if you want. <laughs> um, so, um, so I, I don't really, uh, I don't really have a great um, method for for monitoring that. And in some ways, I think that's good. Partly because um, things come and go so quickly online, and these memes erupt and then they go away. And if you're obsessed with finding those things, really, what you're going to be doing is you're just going to be adding your voice to the. Uh, to the to the most dominant voice at the moment, and it's hard to stand out if you're really, you know, focusing too much on caring about that stuff. Completely being out of it and missing the boat altogether is not, you know, the the alternative. But um, but for me, that's not a focus. Uh, like like you know, making sure I'm on top of exactly what's happening at this moment, um, because I, I feel like that can actually be a bit of a, a trap to get ensnared in. Um, and then I also, I didn't quite understand the question, so I just talked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and I should mention that, uh, that Brienne is a Fairhaven student. The next question is from Brenna Price, a political science student. Um, how effective is social media in raising awareness for causes? Um, and how would someone who may not have the same amount of influence or clout as you maybe want to create a social movement to reach a large amount of people? Um, well, I think at this point, I, I, it's hard to imagine how, how people raised awareness for causes in the pre-social media era. Um, I mean, I guess that we, we used to see ads on uh, broadcast television um, for you know, big campaigns, um, but it's really, really challenging to get messages out without social media. Social media is for sure the best possible tool for that. Um, I, I think that um, one, one thing to think about if you are trying to get something out there is, uh, is to think about how to get other people to serve as nodes for you. So if you have uh, 10 or 15 followers, you can get, and you can get those 10 or 15 followers to spread a message to their followers, um, very quickly you can amplify your reach. Um, so thinking about not just how to message your followers, but how to, how to send a message out there that other people are going to want to propagate for you organically is a really key filter to apply when you're thinking about how to gain um, a, the, the maximum reach on something. Um, you know, there, there are examples of things that just sort of took off like that, like uh, the ice bucket uh, challenge for ALS was something that was, uh, was a sort of a, a domino effect across the internet, um, and that was because it was the, it was designed to get people to reach out to their circles and to get them engaged as well. Um, so, you know, do the ice bucket challenge would be one piece of advice. <laughs> um, you know, applying that filter when you're um, thinking about how to um, talk about a cause that you're interested in is really key. And there's also incredible tools out there. Um, like CrowdRise, for instance. Right now, I'm running a campaign on CrowdRise, which is a fundraising platform. It is just a really simple interface. Um, this is for random acts. And, um, and what, what I did on this fundraiser is I'm having other people um, do their own fundraisers um, for the same cause. So, so it's not just me that's raising money, but I'm asking other people to raise money themselves and ask their circles of, of friends. Um, a good example of how that worked well was last year in Gishwa's The Scavenger Hunt. Um, we, um, we found a Syrian refugee family that was living in Lebanon, and we made, an, uh, made it an item in our scavenger hunt to get 10 of your friends. You people weren't, the participants in the scavenger hunt weren't allowed to contribute to this, but their, their assignment for the scavenger hunt was to get 10 friends to make a donation to the cause of, you know, finding a housing uh, funding for school and medical care for this family. And that very quickly um, becomes, uh, you know, it's orders of magnitude really quickly. Um, we went to bed after posting that and woke up the next morning and had more money had come in than, uh, 
we needed to take care of that family for the next five years. So we were like, ah, oh, we have to find another Syrian refugee family <laughs> in Lebanon right now that needs help. And so we scrambled and we did. What ended up being over the course of the, you know, the next three days, we t t raised $250,000 to take care of four families for the next five years. And like, they're all moved into apartments, their schools are paid for, their medical bills are taken care of. This one girl, I'm gonna tear up. Um, this girl in that campaign who uh, had tried to kill herself because so that there would be enough food for the other kids in her family. Mm -hmm. Their family had been living in this like rundown tent for, for two years and were running out of food, they were starving. She tried to kill herself twice so that the other kids in her family would have enough food. And you know, now they are I'm, um, now they're in an apartment that's beautiful, and she's talking about how when she grows up, she wants to be a doctor, which is just so cool. Um, but the reason that that worked was we got, we didn't just, I didn't, you know, just, uh, Gishwas, by the way, has a much smaller reach. Um, this was like, we were talking at that point to a few tens of thousands of people, not to millions of people. But when each of those people reach out to 10 people, all of a sudden, you have a really, really big audience, and it can make a really big impact. So that's a long uh, answer to a short question. Yes. <laughs> that was, uh, that was <clears throat> cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Um, the next question is from Leanne Greer, who is an art history uh, major. Uh, when first creating your social media persona, I think you addressed this to some degree, but um, uh, nice to summarize. Did you have any sort of branding in mind for yourself or what you wanted to achieve out of it? Was there a point? Um, you know what, I mean, I, I did address that to an extent with the whole Marilyn Monroe yeah. thing, uh, how I want to be more like Marilyn Monroe. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but if I'm being really honest, when I first started interacting with social media, I was just fucking around and <laughs> having fun with it. Um, and, um, and I think that part of why I have been successful there is that my initial approach to it was not to promote myself, not to promote my show. I didn't even talk about my, I made a, I had a rule that I would not talk about Supernatural for the first several years that I was on Twitter. I never acknowledged the existence of the show except for to call it like a reality show about some ghost hunting brothers. Like when, I, when, when the network really twisted my arm and wanted me to you know, um, market something for them, I would you know, find some contorted way to, to talk about it. But I was really not marketing at first and I wasn't trying to like build a brand or anything. I was just having fun. And that is part of why it has been successful, I think, um, was that I wasn't after something. Yeah. Is there any sort of generalization that you would prescribe based on that that's sort of follow-up for me? Um, Still trying? No, I mean, I think, I, think that it, I think that I've touched on some of it, but it's, you know, it's that 90-10 rule. It's that build a community, you know, try to, try, to, try to just have fun with your followers. Find things that they, um, that they are attracted to and talk about those things. And, and, and I think it's really most important to find things that you genuinely get excited about because there's no way to, ma there's no way to hide that or fake that. Um, when you're doing something that you're genuinely excited in, people want to be a part of it. And it just, it's just true. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's the word. Great. It's very helpful, I know. No, it's, uh, yeah. the, uh, the next question is from uh, Jacob Greger, who is uh, a marketing student. Um, <laughs> Come on. When's the last time we're going to let you <laughs> How does a company, of course it's going to be about a company. Yeah. Um, how does a company avoid losing control of their social media image? Um, I'm not really sure uh, how to answer that because I don't know what that would look like. Um, what is losing control of social? Is, is he here, Jacob? Jacob? Jacob, are you here? Where's Jacob? He left. He doesn't care. Um, <laughs> he's in my class. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Ah, uh, this is a good way to take attendance. Jacob. <laughs> Poor Jacob. Oh Mark that down. Uh, yeah. um, I'm not really sure what losing control of your of your social media image is. I mean, I think that occasionally bad things happen on social media platforms for companies. Uh, they say the wrong thing, or or something um, gets blown out of proportion. Um, uh, you know, I think that not not fanning the flames is generally speaking a, a good idea. 
Um, but I'm not sure what losing control, do you know what that means? Well, yeah, I think it's okay. <laughs> uh, So let's take United Airlines. Yeah. So, um, like, mm -hmm. um, I've, I would say that they probably um, lost control of the image that they're trying to convey as an organization that welcomes all kinds of travelers um, and allowed uh, the media to characterize them mm -hmm. rather than controlling their own image. That might be one example. But what could they have done otherwise? Let them on the plane. Well, yeah, but that's not, I mean, the, the, prob so the problem is I think that that's like a fluke instance, like where, you, you, you know, United has uh, probably 50,000 employees. They're not going to be able to control how all of those employees behave at all, at all times. Somebody's going to do something stupid. Something is going to become an internet phenomenon. And um, I mean, I think that the best thing that, that they could do is like get out ahead of it and say, "I'm sorry," and yes. and you know, try to take try to take the wind out of it as much as possible and take responsibility. I think that's a that's a key thing, like denying and posturing and acting like you didn't do anything wrong is a surefire way to piss people off and to make them go after you harder. Right. So, taking responsibility uh, if something goes wrong is really key. I think it's. When a company quickly, and you see this from time to time, doesn't get as much attention because um, I think Toyota did something um, before the Prius stuff blew, blew out of proportion. There was a time like 10 years prior where they had been a, a really good example. Like something went wrong with, with one of their uh, cars and they immediately put out an announcement, we are sorry, this is a mistake, we're recalling. They got ahead of it um, and took care of the problem. Yeah, it was expensive to them, but it preserved their image as a company. And then when you know the Prius brakes started failing or whatever, they they were slow to respond. They were slow to take responsibility. There was a little bit of like, well, we're not really sure it's a problem yet, or not. And it really hurt the company a lot. So being adaptive and responsive and taking responsibility when things are not going well, I think is probably the best answer. Yeah, I suppose the difference is the, um, and I think that, that the skill that, that Toyota showed in that case is they controlled their brand position rather than having uh, outsiders control the position in the case of United. United was repositioned by its competitors um, in a way that wasn't friendly to the brand. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that perhaps that was unfortunate and Toyota or United probably could have handled it in a way where that didn't happen. Yeah. But we can talk about that in class sometime. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want another question? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay. Uh, this one is from William Hancock, who is also a marketing student who unfortunately could not be here. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I know. <laughs> two is a pattern. Uh, two is a pattern. Uh, how do you measure if your campaign is successful or not? Do you use metrics? Yeah, I mean, that's the easiest, quickest thing to do is on any given thing that you post online, uh, you can see the numbers of people who are engaged with it uh, or the number of comments that have come in, and that's one way to measure it. Uh, if you're raising money for a fundraiser, you can see how much money has come in. Um, um, those, are, um, those are, generally speaking, the easiest ways to, I mean, they really do give you the tools um, to measure those things very quickly and easily these days. And a lot of that is because of marketing. Um, they're giving customers these metrics to measure um, their customers' their customers' engagement um, so that they can better market. Um, but there's a lot of metrics out there. Like if you, if you dig into my Facebook feed, I can see how many people watched a given video in Lithuania and how many of them were women and how old they were. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you really get a lot of detailed uh, information. How many seconds into the video they stopped watching because you were so boring? <laughs> How many people are on the Facebook live stream right now? Probably four. <laughs> Who do we get? Yeah, close to four. <laughs> um, uh, any, any last questions here for people who have hands? Yes. You know what, that's actually, for me, that's, that's a juggling act and it's kind of hard. A lot of times people will say, hey, would you mind posting this thing? And I'm like, ah, I hate to be the guy that says no, but 
I'm also trying to raise money right now for my charity, and I'm, you know, we're also, you know, closing in on the season finale for the show, and I don't want to, I don't want to clog up my stream with messages that uh, that aren't really like Im super important to me personally. I will do, I will do it for friends sometimes, and um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna support my friends, um, but a lot of times I do have to say no, which is like, so it's, it's really hard for me. I really hate doing it, but. Um, you do have to look at the big picture. And there are, there is this phenomenon called donor fatigue, and people don't want to be asked to buy something or to donate all the time. And if you do that too much, people just tune out. So there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns. You know, if I, if I ask too many times, uh, I'll end up getting less, you know, for everybody than if I had had a few heartfelt, judicious posts. Um, so it's a, it, uh, for me, it's not a hard science, um, but it is uh, something that I calculate for sure. Yes, <laughs> you have the tallest piece of headdress, so you should ask a question. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm a drag queen, and my name is Spooky Spice. Hi, Spooky Spice. I'm Alicia Collins. How are you? I'm doing really well. But I get to say my Twitter handle, it's Spooky Spice, but an IE at the end. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I deeply appreciate thing and especially your talent at creating stunts and I was wondering if you had any advice on doing stunts and strange things that promote your social media image by having people see that you're wacky and zany and wonderful. Uh, so the question is how do you how do you uh, do an online stunt that promotes your zaniness uh, and your out-of-the-box thinking um, and, and I guess catches on. Um, I, I, this might be a little bit counterintuitive, but I would never, ever market it as wacky or zany. Um, market what you're doing as ordinary, mundane, and boring, but then flip it and do something that is totally, um, totally bizarre. Um, if you are on the nose, like, look how crazy I'm being right now, um, then people are going to be like, yeah, they are being crazy. <laughs> That's not that interesting. But if you're like, yes, I'm, uh, you know, if you were to take your a photo of yourself right now, like uh, I, I, you know, I, I try to dress uh, extra conservative today for the marketing panel. Um, I know that there are job recruiters there, and then you took a photo of yourself. That to me is much more engaging than well, look how crazy I am. Um, so I, I think that there's definitely something to the framing uh, of your presentation that is good. And then another thing you can do is, like I've said multiple times, flip, flip the script. Do something that's unexpected um, with uh, a conventional piece of technology. You know, if there's a, if there's a standard way that people expect something to be done, but you do it different. Um, that is a really good way to catch people's eyes. Do we have time for one more, or are we done? Actually, um, I, we're done? I think we're done. We're good. But I think that, that that's a great question, actually, to end on. Um, there's a great marketing lesson in there. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming and indulging this. Um, <laughs>